Americans, this time to AP World History. Starting this year, which is our first year for offering this course, all AP World History multiple choice questions will begin with and refer to what the College Board rather unhelpfully calls stimulus materials. In other words, there won't be a lot of straight factual recall questions. And there are basically two ways to look at this change. You can look at the stimulus material as clues that help you boot up some of the history you're going to learn this year and make it easier to access your mental hard drive on the AP exam. Or you can look at the stimulus materials as one more obstacle that the College Board sets up to make it harder to get to that 3, 4, or 5 on the AP exam. I think you can guess where Ms. Jacobs and I come down on that. So what does stimulus material mean anyway? Well, sometimes the stimulus is going to be a segment from a primary source. So here, for example, is the stimulus for four actual College Board questions that are going to appear on your first unit test. Now, don't start copying them frantically. You're going to get a copy of the stimulus material, although not of the questions, before the exam. This document actually does contain a bunch of clues about the Assyrian Empire. If you learn something about Assyria in the first place. And if you learn how to pick up hints from a document, these so-called stimuli should ease some of the brute memorization challenges of prepping for an AP exam. Sometimes the stimulus will be a secondary source, often a historian's interpretation of historical events. So a longer version of this quote is going to show up on your exam as well. Based on this quote, what do you think this geographer considers the worst mistake in the history of the human race? Actually, it's the invention of agriculture. Uh, we didn't assign the entire article, but it is up on Moodle if you'd like to peek. Sometimes the stimulus will be a work of art or of architecture. So here's one for my former art history students. What is this and what clues might it offer about its culture? Well, it's a little portion of the war side of the Sumerian standard of Ur. It tells you, among other things, that the Sumerians had war vehicles, and in fact, this is the first historical record we have of any such thing. The animals were not horses. They were probably a kind of donkey. Horses wouldn't be introduced into Mesopotamia from Central Asia for another 600 or so years. Note, too, that the wheels don't have spokes. That really important innovation came later from Central Asia as well, and it would make true war chariots possible because those kinds of wheels were much lighter and moved much faster. The Hittites, armed with spoked wheel war chariots, would overrun Mesopotamia in the 18th century BCE, so stay tuned. The materials also tell us a story. The blue is lapis lazuli from what today is Afghanistan. The white is mother of pearl shell from the Persian Gulf, and the red stone or carnelian came all the way from India, which means that the Sumerians traded with people hundreds of miles away. So here's another kind of stimulus material, charts and also graphs. So what does this chart, which is also on your unit test, tell you about world population up to the point where our story begins? I'll give you a hint, which is a good hint for a lot of charts. Pay attention to the intervals. Well, what you see is that all but one of the rows represents an increase of about 1 million people. But take a closer look. It took 700,000 years for world population to reach 1 million from about 100,000. And of course, these are all guesses. It took another 275,000 years, or about a third of that time, to get up above 3 million. It took 15,000 years, or about 1 50th of that time, to get up to 4 million, and it took only 3,000 years to get to 5 million. And that suggests something rather important happened around 8,000 BCE. And yes, 8,000 BCE is in fact the approximate date that archaeologists give for what is called the Neolithic Revolution, or the onset of agriculture. So let's detour back to our secondary source. Does the chart contradict Diamond's claim? Not necessarily. Diamond acknowledges that women are producing more babies. He just doesn't think it's good for their health. And what's so great about population increase anyway? Actually, there are good answers to that question. Can you think of any? So there aren't any graphs on our first unit test. I'll save those for later. There are plenty of maps, however. So what do you think this map might show? And I'll give you another hint. I've already talked about it. This is a 
an approximate historical map of the spread of the spoke-wheeled chariot between the years of 2000 and 500 BCE. Notice how quickly this technology spreads within Asia and how long it takes to get to Northern Europe. Notice too that we see spoked wheel chariots show up fairly quickly in the Indus Valley of India and the Yangtze Valley of China, two other centers of early civilization we'll be talking about in the next few days. Basically, victorious civilizations acquired the spoked wheel and horse-drawn chariots. Otherwise, they got taken out of the game. So here's a more mysterious map. I added the circle more or less in the area of the Levant, that's the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, where agriculture first emerged, and Mesopotamia, which is further east. Basically, if you'd extend that circle down into the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you would see you'd get to Mesopotamia. So this is what topography looked like almost at the end of the Ice Age, and those mixed coniferous deciduous forests and meadows were great places for big game to hang out. And here's what it looked like a thousand years later in a period of global cooling that climatologists call the Younger Dryas period. So what in the world might this have to do with the emergence first of, agricultural, of agriculture and then of civilizations? Well, we don't know for sure about any of this. We're, we're relying on archaeological uh, evidence. But one theory is that sudden drying and cooling killed off a lot of the big game and forced populations of hunter-gatherers into smaller spaces on the edges of the desert. Fewer woolly mammoth steaks, more mouths to feed in a smaller space. What is a Paleolithic family to do? Well, maybe they need to start paying more attention to those seeds that have been sprouting accidentally by the garbage dump. Here's another map, this time showing rainfall. Note that the darker purple means more rain. And here's the same map. Oh, here's a map showing the spread of agriculture in the Middle East. Note that the darkest green is the area that I call the Levant. Uh, today that would be Israel, Lebanon, etc. So let's put the two maps together. What do they suggest? Well, not surprisingly, agriculture seems to have gotten its start in areas where rainfall was heaviest and most reliable. But here's a tougher question. Why might urban civilizations, by that I mean organized cities and not just Neolithic agricultural villages, have arisen not in the Levant, but in Mesopotamia to the east and Egypt to the west, both of which had much lower rainfall? Well, these two regions, as the map shows you, had rivers, a plentiful source of water, but only if it was channeled and controlled. River Valley silt is very, very fertile, but it has to be wet. And to get it and keep it wet usually means taming those rivers and creating irrigation channels. That kind of large-scale public work project demands organization and cooperation, even coercion. Presto, enter the state. Just to look at another couple of maps, here are the Neolithic settlements in Anatolia, today's Turkey and the Levant, you know, and here are the earliest civilizations in the valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates, uh, or Mesopotamia, and the Nile, or Egypt. One more map, if we have time. So what's this showing? It's a little hard to read. I think I may have cut off the top of that. Uh, but basically, it shows how hard it is to get from one region to another. The red are areas that are very difficult to pass, such as deserts and high mountains. Notice it is very hard to get to Egypt, except by water. It is not especially hard to get to Mesopotamia. That means it is much easier to trade for lapis lazuli, mother of pearl shells, and carnelian, but it's also a whole lot easier to invade with your spoked wheel horse chariots. We're going to practice a lot more with primary and secondary sources, charts, graphs, and maps. Consider this just your first nibble.